the cool thing about being in a franchise is like you instantly join this network of people of like-minded individuals who are running the exact same business model all over the country and like those guys become my friends i see them four times a year and we chat and we text and like so like you've got this mastermind-esque like uh system and yeah those guys are going through acquisition they they teach me about owner financing now i'm like teaching other people about owner financing Welcome to another episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Today, we bring you Brian Beers, and he has got a fun podcast of his own, but we're going to jump right in. Brian, tell us who you are and what do you do? Hey, Todd. Well, thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so my, uh, I'm 35 years old. My brother and I operate, uh, as of today, we have 32 uh, automotive repair franchises. And so awesome. all in the Philly, Philly, New Jersey area. And, you know, it's a business that we scaled from just a handful that kind of our, our dad had legacy business, took it from six to 32 in the last cool. six or seven years. So very awesome. So you are a franchisor. You got e, 36 franchisee. of these things. Franchisee. You are the franchisee. Okay. Yep. Sorry about that. So you are the franchisee. You got 36 locations. How in the world? Like your dad did six and, and how, and how many years have you and your brother built that up? Yeah, so I joined in 2010 uh, with six locations. I mean, I was out of college, ever looking to kind of retire and, and just get out of it. And I learned the business right and, you know, I traveled around the country, learned best practices and implemented and things worked, things didn't. And, you know, it took, it took about six years of, of me learning the business and deciding, hey, we really want to grow this thing. Uh, and then 2016, we, we bought our first two like additional locations that my brother and I owned, you know, s- separately awesome. from our dad. And then, um, you know, we just kind of rolled it. And so we took the, all the money we made on the two, we bought another and another, and then a group of seven and a group of five and a group of three. And, nice. uh, so we went from, you know, six or six locations in 2016 to, you know, today we have, we have 32. So, uh, it's been kind of these, it. these big jumps. So growth through acquisition is super cool. And, and, and what did you have to do to like get your model, your systems in place to feel like you could actually acquire these things, make them feel like they're part of the family and, and get them to function? Yep. So, I mean, that's one of the, the, the biggest benefits that I talk about on my podcast on Twitter with a franchise system is it's really easy to grow through acquisition because when I'm buying like an existing franchise, like they're operating the same name, they have the same core process. Customers are already familiar with it, right? So like for me to walk in, you know, we have our flavor of doing things, right? And, you know, we're much, we're a good operator, but, you know, and but, but so day one, we can buy these things and we can rope them in. And for the frontline team, like life doesn't change too much on the first day or two or three, right? Right. And so so the easy transition for the frontline team, because it's in in a franchise system is what makes acquisition very easy in a franchise system. It's got to make him feel a lot of relief because a lot of people are trying to figure it out if they got two or three locations. And to be honest, it's probably super frustrating. They don't understand the principles they need to know in that growth and scaling journey. And so you probably come in kind of like a savior type role and help them more than hurt them, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, I help them because for most people that we're buying, like I'm the retirement plan, you know, they want to, <laughs> they're older, they want to get out or, you know, I've had some guys are younger and they, they had a W2 job and the, the business was like, the franchise yeah. was like a side business, but they're not making any money. They're stressed out with all the like employee issues. And we come in and, yeah. you know, we're, we, we buy them. We, you know, a lot of times it's owner finance. So now they get payments from us. And, you know, nice. then our, the people are excited because we go in there, we're full of energy. We upgrade the computers, we're doing marketing, we paint the building, we update the lights, we fix the equipment, right. whatever. We invest a ton of money post sale. And now these guys are excited because they have all this new stuff and we're high energy. And right. uh, a lot of times we have the same exact team and we can get 50% more out of literally the exact same people. Uh, and then other times, yeah, we got to totally restaff the store. We all, they all get fired or they all quit, whatever happens. Right. <laughs> but then, you know, right. as, as you grow, like we've got, uh, you know, we've got this bench of people. So if the whole shop quits, like on, you know, week day 20, like it happened two, two weeks right. ago or two months ago, whatever, No way. like we have guy, we can just pull guys from different stores. Right. And so like, nice. as you get bigger, it's, it's easier for us to take on more risk knowing that like, listen, everybody quits right. one day. We're totally fine. If, if you only had one location, you're going to two or two to three, like you don't really have that. Right. So then you're kind of handcuffed to, to pay premiums or to, to not do the deals because you're afraid of, of, the, of this scenario. Right. Okay. This is super cool because honestly, like most people that I talk to who are building a franchise model, 
they're out there trying to sell the franchise before this the buyers have a store or they have anything like unto it. It's like their first experience running a business. Hey, go buy into a franchise and do this thing, right? Like go buy a McDonald's or what have you. But what you're saying is completely different than what I've experienced in the franchise model, which is, hey, you've been running this thing for a while. You've been you've done all right, but we like the location. There's some strategic value there. You want to get out of the day to day and we're going to help you get there. That is a really cool model. Did you think that that was what you're going to do going into it? Or were you thinking something different? I mean, um, how did this evolve? I mean, there's two parts. One, I guess there's two things. Yes, uh, that that is was our plan because it's much easier to grow through acquisition in, in a lot of cases. Right. Now, as an outsider looking in, it's very hard to buy an existing franchise because if right. you know franchisees want to sell to other franchisees, an existing franchisee wants to sell to me, they don't want to sell to right. that outsider because the franchisor has to approve them. They don't understand their business. Sometimes I'm buying things right. that aren't profitable, right? But I understand it, right. so I don't really care. Uh, so a lot of times when people want to break in and they ask, you know, people ask me this all the time, like my recommendation is kind of this like build and buy where you, you might build, you might have to get into your first one as, as a, as a new location. But then once you're right. in, now you're part of the country club and you can go through and just start acquiring <laughs> your neighbors right. and other locations and like, you know, making sure you like and excel at the business before you spend millions of dollars in debt and SBA sure. and all this stuff. Right. Um, sure. so that's, that's like, that's kind of my advice. And, and, and yeah, I think different brands are different. Like I'm in a legacy system. It's Midas, right? It's been around for 65 right. years. So there's a lot of older owners. Right. Um, but I have friends doing this exact same thing in other, in, in emerging brands in you know, not as legacy brands, you know, cause at right. the end of the day, people buy into franchises that, and, and it just doesn't work out and they want to sell and they want to sell right. to someone who's convenient that they know, like, and trust. So. But it's very, it's very smart. I mean, who taught you to look for these opportunities? Because I mean, this isn't, again, like, and maybe I'm abnormal. Maybe you're a lot more normal than I am. But like, I, I just haven't really heard of this. Like, who taught you to go look for acquisition to build your franchise as opposed to just like, hey, we're going to go in and throw a shop right next to, you know, like I saw uh, in Utah, Big O Tires right yep. next to Costco Tires. And I'm like, that's kind of crazy. But whatever, they know their they know their model. How did you learn to do this? Like it's really smart. Yeah, I don't I mean, maybe it was just through other friends. Like I said, I spent six years. I the, the cool thing about yeah. being in a franchise is like you instantly join this network of people of like minded individuals right. who are running the exact same business model all over the country. And they those guys become right. my friends. I see them four times a year and we chat and we text and like so like you've right. got this mastermind esque like uh, system, and yeah, right. those guys are going through acquisition. They they teach me about owner financing. Now I'm like teaching other people about owner financing. <laughs> uh, and by the way, if that Big O in Utah probably crushes it. Like they, I, Big O is like a sister brand. They probably do to mine. They, they and, uh, probably no do. specifically I, Utah is like the highest volume uh, Big O's in the country. So is it really? Yeah, there's a Salt Lake. The ones there's in like these like Salt Lake City, and they um yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Yeah. No, no, they do well. They do well for sure. I, I just, uh, yeah, no, it's crazy. I, I don't, anyway, I don't know their numbers, but I do know they do well. And I know I just, I always buy from Costco. That's here or there. That's here or there. So as you have grown this thing, tell us about your, um, your internal growth. I mean, again, you've told us kind of the journey. Are there some highlights along the way? Like what, what switches did you have to flip? to kind of turn your mind on to like, yeah. holy crap, in, in five years, 10 years, this is where we could be. Yeah, so I think the biggest one was first thinking like c c to go into a new market. So we had 12 stores, 11 stores, whatever, and, and kind of all in the Philadelphia area. You know, I could right. get to every store, you know, it was like 15 minutes to the next. They were all like really tight. And for a lot of times, like my belief was like, we were, and we were successful. We had, we have high volume stores, you know, right. and my, my belief was like, we do so well because I'm hands on. Right. And then if I buy right. stores in New Jersey or, or Maryland or anywhere else, I'm not going to be able to hands on and thus I won't be successful. And so like that was like right. a limiting belief that I had for, for many years and that, that kept us from looking outside of, you know, a pretty tight radius. And so I, right. at a certain point I got over it and said, Hey, listen, like if other people can do it, I can do it. And that as long as I can hire, you know, local you know, district managers to oversee the stores and I can sure. have them treat the stores as I would, which is like, you're in the stores every day, your hand, you get to know all the people, like you get the image, right? right. You like, you, you know, yeah. eight, if they can do 80% of the way that I would do it. Right. And that progress right. is more, is more important than perfection. 
that right. that would allow us to grow. So that was like a first big win, limiting belief that I got over. It says, all right, listen, like that's huge. We can do it in Philly. We can do it an hour and a half away. And honestly, COVID was a big part of that because, like, you know, for a while, like, I didn't, I didn't go to stores. Like, I went to stores occasionally, but not as much. <laughs> and we had success. Right. And I said, all right, well, my stores are having success, and I'm not in them every day. Like, I have a district manager right. here in Philly. And so, what's the difference between being an hour and a half away or you know, 20 minutes away? If I, if either way, I'm not going to them like on a, on a regular basis sure. and I have, but I have people who are going to them. And so I got right. over that, you know, that allowed us to go to like expand, you know, 11 stores in New Jersey and now seven more up in uh, about an hour North of, of Philadelphia in the sub market. Cool. And so uh, that, that was the first big one. Another big one was, you know, we, we hired, uh, so as, as we've grown, I've replaced myself. Like I was the district manager. I replaced myself. Yeah. You know, eventually I became like the COO where I had four or five district managers all reporting to me. Um, right. And another big win was like letting go of that reins and hiring a, a COO and somebody totally. who could take over all the daily operations. And so we found a guy who, um, you know, came from the military and excellent in operations and very organized. And to be honest, does those a, are great operations yep, managers, aren't they? He does a better job than me uh, right. in that role. So then I focus on growth and new opportunities and, and you know everything else that I'm focused on. So. I am so glad you're here, and I just wanted to take a few seconds to tell you about a program that we have assembled with a lot of our podcast guests and a lot of people who are listening to the show who are feeling the same way that they do. There's a recurring theme. You'll hear a lot of these founders talk about, I couldn't have done it without my team. I couldn't have done it without a a support group of peers. I couldn't have done it without having someone to talk to that understood my feeling of isolation as an operator of my business. You see, you're not alone. It is hard running a business and it's even harder when you know you can't express all your deepest concerns and frustrations with your executive team. It makes them nervous. It gets them scared. You don't want scared people on your executive team. So where do you turn? The captain's council is where you turn. The captain's council it is an organization that we are put together with podcast guests, as well as people who are listening, who are in the same boat. You see, peers are the only ones that can give you the type of empathy, the type of advice that only a founder or operator know and understand. Go check it out at captainscouncil.com. I know you're gonna love what you see there. We have put together an organizational structure that has small group settings, a global community of founders and operators, as well as monthly and quarterly in-person events. You're gonna love what you see there. I can't wait for you to check it out and enjoy the rest of this episode. I love it, love it. This is, this is fantastic. I love your journey and I love that you share other people's journeys on your podcast. You know, I, I've listened to a few of your episodes and you are really into helping other people with their franchise models and helping them build these things out. Tell us how, how has that um, affected your own growth in your business as you've been listening and sharing other people's stories of their growth. Yeah. So yeah, I've got this. So yeah, I got on Twitter. I have a podcast, you know, I talk about, obviously, you know, we've had tremendous success in building this, this business. It's given me a lot of you right. know, time and money and relationship freedoms. And, and so, yeah, I want to help other people, um, go down the same journey I don't. And like I said, if I can do it, they can do it. Like, it's not no, right. one's, no one's special, right? It's just superpowers here. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I help people get into franchises. I teach them now about- That's what you say. Yep. That's <laughs> that's the thing, right? And, uh, and and I'm successful with it. I've gotten, we've, you know, gotten a number of people in and, and they're, they're crushing it. Yeah. And, um, and so anyway, I, I really enjoy that. I enjoy connecting with other people. I enjoy, you know, seeing success in other people. And I believe, you know, that the bigger my world gets, that the more opportunities are, are created for people that are in my world. Uh, and so- 100%. You know, and how it's so I've connected with people through probably through Twitter and private, equity, you know, multiple private equity guys, guys just doing yeah. really cool things and that, I, that I've learned, learned a lot from. Um, and it yeah. also allows me to be uh, not in the weeds so much in my own business since I'm going to be For focused sure. only on the big things uh, that helps us grow. Uh, and then it allows me to then, you know, give more uh, responsibilities and, and, um, delegation to the, the COO and he's the guy to get in the weeds, right. And figure it all out. And so, right. uh, which will allow us to continue to grow and, and attract better people to our team and continue to grow the business. hundred percent. So, hundred percent. 
Dude, I love it. I love it. This is a great model. Great, great job. Congrats. Yeah, now, thanks. Honestly, I, I'm so proud of you. This is a really cool thing you've done. And a lot of people will inherit a business from a, a parent and just kind of maintain status quo is hard enough for them. Whereas you 5X the production or 6X the production and the output and the number of stores and locations. Seriously, like it's super awesome. Way to go. Yep. Now, it's not always easy. Like, it, it, in fact, sometimes it really sucks. What have you hit along the way that you didn't anticipate when you started like this acquisition model? Is, are the things that popped up that you're like, holy crap, this wasn't as cool as I thought it would be? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I mean, ours are highly leveraged, right? We take on a ton of debt. I mean, I've, yeah. you know, we bought a $2 million, we did a $2 million acquisition with $50,000 down, it was 97% <laughs> financed, right? So like, Woo. you have to believe, you know, you, we, yeah. like, I have to believe in our ability that we can you know, make, you know, we can make the payments. Like once again, I'm this guy's retirement plan. So like, I take it personally right, that, right. you know, I don't want to screw him over. Like he's, you know, he's giving me a good opportunity. And obviously that puts a, totally. you know, that could put a lot of pressure on someone to, to make sure they perform. Now, obviously I trust in our ability. I trust in my team. Uh, and we're, right. we're absolutely just like crushing it there where numbers are really good. Uh, and so anyway, but that's been, you know, I, I, I think you really got to get over that. I know some people like yeah. how, how, you know, taking on debt, how you view it. Do you view it as, you know, our, our, our model is like, let's take on as much debt as possible to buy it. Right. But then yeah, once it starts yeah. making money, we take that cash and we, we pay down, we pay down debt and we pay down, we kind of use the snowball effect. Right. right? And yeah. so I'm comfortable with it, but like, you know, it took me some time and some, some getting over some fears there. Uh, <laughs> Cause otherwise if you only grow want to grow by cash or like, or, or going yeah. into risky situations that you don't trust yourself, right? That could be bad. It's impossible. Um, yeah. You know, and also like we're not Superman. Like we've taken over stores and, you know, we lost $100,000 in the first nine months. So, you know, and they were yeah. already losers it before and we knew sucks. that, right? Yeah. But then we thought, oh, we'll come in there. You know, we'll get this thing fixed in no time. And like, like even we struggle. Now today we're doing, we're, we're doing good, uh, you know. I don't know if we made that hundred K yeah. back yet. Well, we're not losing money. I know that. <laughs> so anyway, that's like, that's been a big challenge. I think one that if you're not prepared for it, like, and that yeah. you think oh, I'm like, it's a loser, but no problem. I got this. And like, if you're only making 200 and now you take on this thing that's losing a hundred, like you just gave yourself a huge pay cut, um, totally. while you fix it. Right. Um, totally. So that's been big. Another big challenge I think has been like, you know, those, those senior leadership positions, you know, we've made some mistakes along the way in the, in the first couple of people we hired that were convenient and that I saw things in them that, uh, you know, I was misguided right. on it. And, and so right. then those people ended up doing like sometimes more damage than if you never hired them at all, because they, they become like <laughs> a cancer, right. Of, of, you know, <laughs> for sure wanting to have, well, I forget what it's called, but basically like you create a problem just so you can solve it and make it look like you're the hero. And so I, yes. I had some, I had, yes. a, I had a guy or two like that, that, uh, you know, a couple years ago, was just terrible for the culture. It was terrible for me. And it led to like all kinds of issues. And so just be like really careful and stringent on like who you let in that leadership door. Cause once you get them in, it's really hard to get them out. Totally. Totally. My, I, I had a business partner for about 10 years in my twenties and early thirties. And, and I forget where the quote even comes from, but it, we, every month we'd have our, our little sit down and we'd re evaluate everything. And we're like, you know, we'd always say this every month. It's not who we don't hire that kills our business. It's who we don't fire. And we'd evaluate all of our leadership. And it like truly is one of those things that That's a good if one. you don't get rid of the cancer, yeah, yeah. No. dude, it, it, it spreads like crazy. Yep. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Dude, I, honestly, this has been so cool. I love, you've shared a lot of little insights and little tidbits on, along the way here that uh, I wanted to dive deeper into, but we really don't have time. But honestly, like I, I really feel like what you've been able to do and what you've been able to accomplish is inspiring to a lot of people listening. You know, a lot of people think about their business as this is my, this is my baby. This is, this is, I launched this thing. I want to see it grow into adulthood. What do you say to those people when there's oftentimes a good opportunity to, to sell to someone like you who can take it and make it something better? Some people are just better launchers than they are growth and scaling guys. What do you say to those people that might be thinking, I never want to leave my business, but it's just smarter for them to do it? Yeah. I mean, I think it really depends on like what, you know, what gives them energy, you know, what, what feels heavy, what feels light, 
you know, I think for a lot of right. times these guys, like it's the, in our business, it's the employees, you know, we deal with automotive mechanics right. and technicians and they're, you know, hard to hire. Sometimes they're hard to retain. And, you know, they right. think they start to really get worn out and it feels really heavy to have to go and like hire these guys and manage these guys and just like, right. um, dealing with the customers. And that's like the pain that they'll talk to me about all the complaining about all this right. shit. And like, so I'll, um, so I think if someone's like really starting to feel that and like I had, I had one guy tell me he 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 drove like 45 minutes you know each way from home to the shop and like he just like hated going to work every day like every day he was just like oh <laughs> another day and like 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 so if that's like what you're feeling like and he'd been it for 20 right. years like he he'd been it for a while and he's still in it we haven't bought it right. yet but he he just he can't he can't let go but he like hates his yeah he hates that, that portion funny? of his life and like it's like there's so many things you could do like and so you have so many options and to spend time to do something you hate, uh, feel this like sunk, sunk cost bias or whatever it is. Totally. Um, so anyway, that would be my thing. Like, I think look deep inside. If, if, if it doesn't give you joy, if it feels heavy, you know, it's probably time to look to find something that feels light right. and is fun and gives you energy. You know, and on the flip side of that, you know, as someone who's looking at acquisition, I, I think I, what I hope happens from this episode is that people are inspired that growth obviously happens from from more product awareness, more brand awareness. There's a lot of marketing pieces there. But growth also, also happens through acquisition like you've been able to produce. What do you suggest to people who have never gone down the path of acquiring a competitor or uh, acquiring someone who is a strategic play for them? How did you start to look at that? And how do you suggest people start to think that way as a viable growth model for them? Yeah, so I think it all depends on the, the business model and, and how it how it fits in, right? In a retail footprint, you know, we need access right. to real estate. You know, not necessarily buying the real estate we do when you can, but it's hard. But like, right. you know, right. we have a very specific thing we need: four thousand square feet, major major road, whatever. Uh, and it, it just can't find right. it. So if we want to grow, unless we're willing to buy like some random plot and make a two million, three million dollar thing, which we don't like, the unit economics don't work, right? <laughs> right. The only way right. I can grow is by buying it to get access to that to that shop or to that piece of real estate. Right. So that's one way I think right. about it. Um, I, I think another another way is, you know, like at a certain point, you you've got like what we've seen, like we, it's like stairs, there's like this stair step growth component where like we have to yeah. invest a certain amount of money to build out like an office manager and like the bookkeeper and like the, right. the district manager and whatever. And like, you know, maybe we've totally. got six locations, but maybe the capacity of that, that team we have is 12 locations. So we can, we can acquire right. 12 more locations. We can add whatever, $8 million of revenue, whatever it is. And we have like zero additional corporate overhead. Right. But then we reach yeah, capacity yeah. and then we got to invest again. Now we hire another district manager. We hire more people in the office and boom, like sure. costs go up. But like now we've expanded that we can go from eight locations to 15 locations and we have zero additional overhead. Love it. And so that's how I kind of look at it a lot. Even for us is like, you know, within my markets, I have a couple markets that are maxed out. Like if we add more, we yeah. spread our guys too thin, but then I have another market. Yeah. I could add three more stores. I could add whatever. I could have $3 million in revenue, maybe more. With with zero right. additional corporate overhead, obviously there's store level you know expenses, sure. but um, so sure. it dilutes. So as you grow, like you dilute your expenses, like those incremental sales become more profitable. So like, that's kind of the process that I look at it. Um, unless I look at a whole new market, if we say, hey, let's go down to Mar we're not in Maryland yet, but let's go to Maryland. <laughs> now it's like, well, I need right. a DM. I'm gonna have this, this, and this. I need yeah. a minimum of four or five stores. If I only could buy one or yep. two, I'm not even gonna make any money. Yep. So like it's kind of like this all or nothing thing. And so you totally. have to kind of, you have to kind of know your numbers and think through that, but then that's, um, that's how right. I approach it. Very cool, man. Very good advice. Very good. Very good story. I, I honestly, I, I can't wait to follow up with you in a year and see where you're at because you've now figured out your blueprint. You now figured out how to strategically make those investments in, in that top level overhead to be able to plug in six or seven stores to that overhead piece yep. and, and make it work. So awesome way to go honestly like i couldn't be prouder of you I, you're not i don't even know you prior to this interview but i seriously like i think all the world of what you've done and the creativity that you and your brother have put into this for those that want to learn more about what brian's doing you got to go check out his podcast brianbeers.com and you can click on his podcast link and take a listen to some episodes It's very inspirational very cool if franchising or acquisition is your thing brian getting to this point though it's hard to do it alone. And I've got to think that your dad is probably sitting back going, I'm so proud of my boys for doing what they've done and, and probably has been a good advisor for you along the way. 
but are there other people in your circle that have been kind of that mentor who's been able to help you adapt this model and, and grow the way you have? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple different, obviously I've, I guess I have two people. One's my brother who's my business partner. We're 50, 50, you know, so I'm kind of the, the front facing guy awesome. and I deal with like the, the relationships and he kind of runs the back office and, and kind of the financials sure. and technology. And so he, he plays a big part in this, uh, to match a skill set that I, that feels right. heavy to me. Um, so anyway, he's huge. And then, you know, another one is I hired a business coach back in, I guess, the beginning of 2021, I think. It's been a while now. Awesome. Uh, Trevor McGregor's his name. He's he's worked with a ton of ton of uh, real estate guys and, and, and some really high level awesome. C- CEOs. And so I've, you know, invested a ton of money in coaching with him. And, he, and he's helped me kind of open up my eyes to uh, some of the things that we talked about, overcoming these limiting beliefs, you know, believing in this path right. of growth, replacing yourself, all this stuff. So anyway. For any like high level you know, guy out there, I think finding it finding a coach, uh, you know, the right coach who who you know matches your skill set and goals um, can be a great investment. I was literally just going to ask you that, like, how has that investment paid off? Because I think a lot of people who are who are self motivated entrepreneurs, startup guys, they do have a hard time thinking that anyone else can help them. Sometimes, <laughs> at what point did you feel like, dude, I just need someone to make sure I'm doing this the right way? Does Michael Jordan have a coach? <laughs> right? yes, he sure does, does. does every single professional <laughs> player have a coach? Right. They all do. Right. And so they all, they all have shooting right. coaches. They've got diet coaches like Tom Brady has a coach, right? Like you name sure. the professional athletes. They want to surround themselves with anybody who yep. they think will give them an edge. And whether it's the yep. slightest edge possible, they know that that they can make, they can get a huge ROI. And, you know, one idea, one over, you know, belief that you overcome one thing right. you know, as an entrepreneur can take your business to 10 exit is well worth the, 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 you know, thousands of dollars that you're going to spend. Thank and you. so anyway, that's my personal opinion. And, you know, I love it. before I started with him, yeah, you know, we had 12, 12 locations. Uh, I didn't have a podcast. I didn't have an audience on Twitter. You know, <laughs> I wasn't really comfortable talking on video. So like a lot of it was, was, was has, has evolved and, you know, he's been a part of that. And just having a sounding board who's can tell you, can right. call you out on your, your bullshit, who can, you know, encourage you, who can challenge totally. you. Um, who has no, you know, he just wants to see you win. So I love it. I love it. Great shout out. And for those listening, if you haven't invested in someone like that or into a peer network or some, some way to build a sounding board for you, I highly recommend you do it now. Like now is the time, you know, launching is hard. It's, it's busy. It's crazy. You're, you're, you're doing all sorts of crazy things. But when you finally find yourself in a position where Brian's at, and you see yourself growing and you see a model that you can grow into, find that coach that can help you fine tune it, find that peer network that can help you like just kind of modify what you're doing into a better way. So Brian, thank you honestly for your time today. We really love your input. We love the time you've taken to put in with us on this. And uh, where can people find you? What's going on in your world? Yes, yeah, the best place. I'm I'm very active on Twitter, so it's just at Brian Beers, um, B R I A N B E E R S, like the drink. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn uh, a little bit. You know, like I said, I have a podcast it's called Business with Beers. Uh, I talk about franchising. I talk about scaling. I I talk about. I bring on some investors too. You know, because the idea is once we're making money, how it. do we invest it? So, uh, but yeah. yeah, Twitter's Twitter's the best place. So, love it. Fantastic. We're going to put links to everywhere you talked about down below. And we are so grateful to have had you on today. And thank you everybody for listening. Can't wait to see you on the next episode. This was such a fantastic interview. Brian and I, I I really just respect the heck out of him. Not only has he grown and scaled his business. And like I said, he's got his own podcast. Check in the comments below for where it's at. But he has got an amazing podcast where he's interviewing other people in these franchise model growth scale, uh, growth and scaling opportunities. Very cool stuff, very cool guy, and an amazing reputation within the industry. I hope you enjoyed the episode. One of the things that we talked about offline a little bit was his, not only did he hire a business coach to help him with a lot of decisions that he had to make, but he also joined a peer community of other founders, other business owners who are running their businesses and needing that peer network to help them kind of let loose and understand each other's problems and help them through them. He's found one and we've founded one. We want to introduce you to the Captain's Council. If you're a CEO or a founder or co-founder in a business, you are invited to come apply and check out what we're doing to help you find the community that Brian found in his. 
every founder needs a community. Every operator needs some people to bounce ideas off of that aren't gonna judge them, that aren't gonna think they're crazy, that aren't gonna think that there's some problem with the way they, they, they run their business now. These groups help you. We wanna be there to help you. Check out the Captain's Council, check out whatever's in your local area. We know that business leaders need community. We have founded this to provide that for you and we feel like all the advantages that you could ever want in a community are here with us. So check out the Captain's Council and we'll see you on the next episode of the Growth and Scaling Podcast. Thank you so much for being here and we'll catch you on the next one.